Alright, Eric, can you show your webcam, please? Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Do you want to wait a second or so for um, um, Andrea? It's up to you. You want to remind about the webcam? No. Well, when we start, right? No. Okay, tell them now. All right. Before we start so, the public meeting. So, although we have uh, now a greater capacity to view webcams, we can see up to 25. We're going to still um, only show your webcam. Turn my cell phone off. Okay, we're going to start now, okay? Ready? Yeah. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Um, welcome. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission for Wednesday, July 22nd. Um, may we please have a roll call, Ms. Navarez? Chair Clark? Here. Vice Chair McGill? Oh, we can see you, Here. but we can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton? Here. Here. Commissioner, Commissioner Longstreet? Thank you, Jacob. Here. Great. Uh, Commissioner Martinez Cohen. Here. Great. And Commissioner Perry. Here. Okay. Okay. Do we have any changes to the agenda? No chair, no changes to the agenda. Thank you, thank you. Um, any written communications? Uh, all written communications are related to items on your agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, and Rose, do we have any members of the public here to speak for a public comment? Not pertaining to items on the agenda? I, I don't I don't hear you. I'm muted. Oh, <laughs> great. For those who wish to speak during public comment, please use the raise your hand functionality in the go to webinar control panel. We are currently displaying a graphic showing where that is located. When I call on you, please unmute yourself and then speak for a maximum of 10 of two minutes. For those who wish to speak on an agenda item later in the meeting, please raise your hand when the item is under discussion and you will be called on when we get to the public comment section of that item. 
and I do not see any uh, raised hands. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll move on to Commissioner Committee Assignment Reports, and I'll start with Commissioner Perry. Arts and Crafts is still not meeting, waiting to see when they return. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lexner Buxton. Is your, are you unmuted? Did you unmute your microphone? Cause I can see you. Actually, oh, there you go. Hi. Um, you tell me so much. Yes, much. Uh, we had a web group meeting the same people will be on it this fall and we will be meeting Greg up in August, but we won't afford any new people in to the spring. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Baker? The Golf Advisory Committee did not meet this month. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Longstreet? Um, I attended, observed <laughs> the Neighborhood Advisory Council meeting at where they introduced the new uh, city staff person, facility manager, um, Angela Osland will be staffing the committee. Uh, they also did uh, neighborhood updates and had an interesting presentation on the changes to the city's organizational chart. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Martinez Cohen. The Creeks uh, Committee, I believe, has still not been meeting. I have not gotten any updates uh, from them since their March uh, budget subcommittee meeting, which was pre COVID. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair McGill. Uh, the Park Foundation did not meet this month. Um, I don't actually have a list and I feel like I'm forgetting somebody other than myself. Roger, Austin, McGill, Longstreet. I nope, guess not. Okay, I, I did, um, I was unable to attend a street tree advisory committee meeting in person, but it was, it was recorded and um, I was able to watch it today. So uh, we discussed every tree that's on the agenda later today and, and we'll get to that later. Um, so as long as I didn't miss anybody, we'll move on to commission and staff communications. No communications unless um, the chair has some. No, I don't. Um, I don't have any uh, communications. And we'll, we'll move on to the summary of council actions. Did anybody have any question of those? They were included in your packet. I'm assuming you all had time to read it. Chair Clark and commissioners, if I could just add that the tree appeal was heard for 1721 by the city, Gillespie by the city council mm -hmm. yesterday afternoon. And the council denied the appeal and upheld the decision of the Parks and Recreation Commission and the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation. Thank you, I was, I, I was aware of that because I was following it and I was, I was very happy to see that the council upheld the decision of staff and the commission. Um, I know the Street Tree Advisory Committee put a lot of work into analyzing that removal request. So uh, we appreciate council's action on that. Um, my, my only question on the, on the summary of council actions was, I don't, I'm not really familiar with Pilgrim Terrace Affordable LP. Um, and I know it's something I should know because we've talked about the community gardens before, but I've never really asked, what is that? Chair Clark and members of the commission, this is the, um, organization that actually owns the land mm -hmm. under which we have the the community garden at Pilgrim Terrace and so we have an agreement with them 
for the operation and maintenance of the community garden, but also they, um, if you've been by there in recent years, see their tower garden is also um, part of that area. So it's really the, the agreement between the city and Pilgrim Terrace for the operation of the community garden. Okay, thank you. Um, should anybody else have any questions on the council actions? All right, uh, uh, regarding the, oh yes, uh, Vice Chairman Gill. Sorry, there we go. Um, um, yeah, I was just a bit curious as to what number one actually was. The, just the the emergency or uncodified emergency ordinance. Just didn't really understand that. Uh, Ms. Zachary, Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill. Uh, the emergency ordinance, it was uh, taken to council as a result of revising the agreement terms uh, with La Serena for the development and operation of the restaurant at the Cabrillo Pavilion. It was taken as an emergency ordinance because otherwise it would require a 40, 45 day period before that ordinance went into effect. And since it was taken as an emergency ordinance, it was effective immediately. Okay, and thank you. The rationale for that was we, we worked on uh, updated terms and uh, the restaurant operators were planning to move forward with their next steps with the restaurant. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, we have the minutes in our packet. We all read them. Would anybody like to make a motion? to waive the reading and approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Is there a second? Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so moved. Um, that brings us to our street tree advisory committee items. Welcome, Mr. Slack. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair Clark and Commissioners. Um, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, next slide. The first street tree advisory item for review is the request to remove nine queen palms and 11 Mexican fan palms from the public right of way located in the 1700 block of East Cabrillo Boulevard. Um, the request is part of a large public works project to reconfigure traffic lanes and install roundabout at the intersection of East Cabrillo Boulevard, Los Patos Way, and Channel Drive. In addition to the proposal for the removal of the nine queen palms and 11 fan palms, the applicant has proposed to replace these trees at a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, in addition to the proposed removals, it's important to make reference to the fact that this site is part of the El Pueblo Viejo Historic District. Uh, there are additional uh, removals that were shown on the application and as outlined in the city's municipal code that regulates uh, not only setback trees and trees on parking lots, approved landscape plans, but also in the El Pueblo Viejo um, Historic District that the Historic Landmark Commission has purview over uh, tr basically trees in the setback or on lots that lo are located within this district. So on the application uh, packet materials, there were 16 additional trees that were um, shown proposed for removal in addition to the, uh, the street trees that the commission will be reviewing today. Also proposed for a one-to-one -one, uh, replacement ratio. Um, and there were, uh, this project was reviewed um, previously uh, on July or January 24th, 2018, where the commission approved 10 uh, additional street tree removals. Um, we've invited Eric Goodall uh, for Public Works to do a brief presentation to provide a little bit more scope on the, the full extent of the project. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Eric to, to give a brief presentation on the um, installation and plans for the career roundabout. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Chair Clark and uh, the commissioners, uh, thank you for reviewing this item. Um, uh oh, okay. I think I was frozen for a minute there. Um, as Nathan indicated, uh, we are pursuing um, the 
the construction of the uh, pedestrian and bicycle improvements for East Cabrillo Boulevard and replacement of the Union Pacific Railroad Bridge. This project uh, is a mitigation project uh, for the Caltrans HOV 101 widening project. Um, and it addresses the, the traffic congestion on Cabrillo Boulevard for vehicles, as well as addressing um, the existing pedestrian and bicycle uh, issues coming through this corridor, going from the East Beach area uh, to um, through the Coast Village Road area of town. Um, right now, there really isn't a good path of travel for pedestrians through this area. And once they get to the Union Pacific Railroad Bridge, they actually uh, are pushed out into the streets. So this project addresses both pedestrian, cyclists, uh, and vehicular needs through the corridor um, by creating a multi-use path uh, from Caltrans right away, uh, north of the UPR bridge, down to the, um, the east beach at the, at the lower southern end of the project. Uh, as Nathan had indicated, this project has been uh, brought to um, Recreation Commission in the past for the removal of 10 Mexican fan palms, as well as some other trees that were located in Union Pacific Railroad right away. Um, at the time, we had 30% design and knew that those 10 trees would be impacted, uh, the 10 Mexican fan palms, and so brought those to the commission. And as we've moved forward in design, now we've reached 95% and we've identified some additional trees that um, so going to be impacted by the layout of the roundabout, um, primarily the layout of the roundabout. So those trees involve the nine queen fan palms um, that are in an island just to the east of the project on the east side, just south of Channel Drive, um, as well as additional Mexican fan palms that are on the northwest corner of the Cabrillo and Los Patos intersection. Um, all of these trees can be, um, well, will be replaced at one-to-one. -one. The Queen Fan Palms, as Street Tree Advisory Committee has recommended and, and requested, we'll look at how many of those can be transplanted from their current location to nearby locations, um, either in a smaller landscaped area, um, south of their current location, or west across the multi-use path that will be installed um, to replace those trees. And the 11 Mexican fan palms that we're looking at replacing, um, they can be replaced very close to their current location. Uh, however, where they are right now is in conflict with the proposed multi-use path uh, on the north side of the road. Nathan, can I drive the slides or are you driving? You can just indicate next slide, thanks. Okay, can you go to the next slide? Um, so the, as you can see, this segment uh, we're showing here, this is the segment just north of the roundabout. Um, and then this slide, this is the, the tree removal map and we've indicated um, the trees that were brought to Parks and Rec Commission a few years ago, uh, the 10 Mexican fan palms, seven of which are in the historic median to the south of the proposed roundabouts, uh, three are to the west. Uh, and then up in Union Pacific Railroad right away, there's a cluster of red that is where the, the private trees to be removed were identified at the previous meeting. Um, the specific trees that we're indicating, the queen palms are Number 40 to 48 down at the uh, southeast end of the project at that Channel Drive and Cabrillo intersection. Um, and then the additional, the additional Mexican fan palms are on that northwest side of Cabrillo at the Los Patos and Cabrillo intersection. Additionally, Nathan said there, there are some private trees and eucalyptus uh, near the Union Pacific Railroad right away as well as one oak tree uh, on the cemetery property that are in conflict with the design and will be replaced at the appropriate ratio with the oak being replaced at a five to one. And those will be 
Those specific trees will be reviewed by the Historic Landmarks Commission. That is my presentation. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> so just to recap, the applicant is requesting the removal of nine queen palms and 10 Mexican or 11 Mexican fan palms from the public right away and proposing to replace them with a, a mitigation ratio of one to one. Um, the Street Tree Advisory Committee reviewed the plans, reviewed the project and the application, and after review, um, made a recommendation to support the removal of the nine queen palms and the 11 Mexican fan palms permitting that there was a replacement mm -hmm. ratio of, of one to one for the project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Goodall. Does anybody have any questions of either Eric or Mr. Slack? Yes, Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, show your face. I'm here. Is this going to help mitigate the traffic jams that occur there typically on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays? Or is there anything being done to address that? I'll defer to Eric at all for that question. Um, this will, the traffic through this corridor has been analyzed um, by plans and it will mitigate the, um, some of the traffic through this corridor. I would have to look at the, the report from Caltrans to tell you exactly in what way it it improves the condition, but it will improve the traffic through this area. Thank you. Are there more questions? Okay, are there um, any, any, is there anybody from the public raising their digital hand to speak? Chair Clark, I do not see any hands. If you would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand on the GoToWebinar control panel. No hands. Okay, Commissioner Longstreet. Uh, I would make a motion to concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for the removal of the 19 trees in the 1700 block of East Cabrillo Boulevard um, with a replacement ratio of one to one. I'm happy to second that motion. Is there any discussion? Um, before we, before we move to vote, I, I had one thing I wanted to clarify. Um, when I was reading our packet, the, there's a statement, if Parks Commission has a desired replacement tree for eucalyptus trees, we welcome the recommendation. And I was confused about that, Mr. Slack, because I believe all the eucalyptus removals were um, approved by and under the jurisdiction of the HLC. Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioners, that is correct. Um, that, that could have been omitted from the report. Um, we went through some review with Public Works to sort out the differences between where the trees were located and which purview they fell under, so that that portion could be um, omitted from the report. So there's okay. there's no need for the commission to provide any type of recommendation for the eucalyptus. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? Okay, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved, thank you. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the next Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for review is a request to remove 24 gold medallion trees located within the 200 block of State Street. The request for the removal of these trees is part of the State Street undercrossing project. Um, at a previous meeting on May 13th of 2020, um, the commission reviewed the removal of six total trees. Um, they were street trees located closer towards the um, intersection of Yon and Ali and State Street, which was also part of this project. Uh, it's a comprehensive project to add uh, a significant pedestrian and cycling improvements to the, the State Street underpass. The, so again, the applicants requesting the removal of up to 24 um, gold medallion trees, given again that this is a public works project. 
Uh, we've asked Jessica Grant, the uh, transportation planner from the city of Santa Barbara to give a project overview um, and, and scope of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slack. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Clark and uh, Parks and Rec Commissioners. I'm Jessica Grant, Supervising Transportation uh, Planner. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, this project is the Vision Zero State Street Undercrossing Project, and the project is located downtown between um, along State Street between East Yonanali and Gutierrez Streets. It connects our highest active transportation neighborhoods, which are downtown and the waterfront. Uh, this undercrossing was originally constructed by Caltrans in 1991. Um, unfortunately, this in its current design is a very collision prone corridor with the highest amounts, uh, highest concentration of serious fatalities um, and severe injuries for pedestrian and bicycle related um, collisions in the city. And uh, as far as this project, the proposed project will meet the needs of the community by widening the sidewalk underneath the bridge and the approaches uh, between Gutierrez and Yananali streets. We'll also be installing some um, additional lighting. Uh, we'll have uh, buffered bike lanes and uh, the travel lanes will be adjusted so you have a north um, and just single lanes north and south uh, but there will be at the approaches uh, turning lanes there uh, this project was um, came out of the pedestrian master plan the bicycle master plan and a 2017 community workshop and design charrette specific for this area in 2019, uh, the city received $4.7 million in grant funding from the Active Tra Transportation Program for this project. Um, construction for this project is anticipated in approximately spring, summer of 2023. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is just a, an example, a cross section of what it would look like underneath the bridge. Um, with the top left corner being the existing configuration and the bottom right, the proposed configuration. So we're essentially uh, widening the sidewalk from about seven feet to 15 feet and the bike bicycle lanes also get increased and there's a buffer um, for them. And then there's the vehicular lanes. Next slide. This is just a quick model um, between the existing and proposed condition. And you'll see the buffered bike lane, widened sidewalk. And then this, uh, the next slide. And this is just a, um, another image for uh, what the uh, future concept is. We're currently in preliminary design right now. So yes, this, as uh, Mr. Slack mentioned, this uh, project did go to Parks and Rec for removal of um, some jacaranda trees that were along the approaches where the sidewalk would be widened. Um, during our site visit um, for those tree removals, uh, we did understand that um, trees that are in this, um, in the setback that are less than four inches also do require street tree committee approval, a review and parks and rec approval. So that's why we're returning to you today about the, the golden medallion trees that are in the upper planter boxes as Mr. Slack showed in one of the photographs. Um, I think at this point, 24 uh, tree removals is um, the worst case scenario. I think we're, uh, as of latest discussions today with as the design, it was around 14 trees. Um, bottom line is if there's a tree removed, um, we will be replacing it. We are working with our uh, landscape architect, Phil Suiting. Uh, what he recommended, um, because we are coming off of years of, of drought in our city, um, those trees are not looking that great. Um, what he suggested is to have some soil amendments um, to occur in the planter boxes and then to replant with um, new trees. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation and um, it, I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you, Thank Jessica. You. <clears throat> uh, Michelle, could you go back to the first slide of the presentation, please?
Thank you. So again, the, on the initial application, the applicant was requesting the removal of 24 gold medallion trees. Um, these occur in raised planters along State Street on both sides of the 101 freeway. During review of the item, the Street Tree Advisory Committee felt that there were several trees within these raised planters that had merit um, in terms of retention. The, as Jessica mentioned, the landscape architect um, and as part of the project is proposing to do some soil treatments to lower the pH and increase the organic matter as well as um, retrofits to the existing irrigation to make it functional. It's been non-functional for several years. Uh, the committee felt that with these um, improvements, like culturally in terms of the soil conditioning and then also supplemental water that several of these trees could improve in terms of their just overall vigor. Um, after review of the item, the Street Tree Advisory Committee made a recommendation to approve up to 24 of the proposed gold medallion removals, but did provide uh, a recommendation that, that the landscape architect take a second look at the project and try to reduce that number. Uh, Michelle, if you could snap to the next slide, that would be great, please. And so what we have here is an updated plan showing the proposed removals. I had the opportunity to walk the project site with the project landscape architect a couple days ago, and we took a really critical look at the trees based on the Street Tree Advisory Committee's recommendation. And after review, uh, we are now proposing to only remove 14 of those trees. So we're keeping 10 additional gold medallion trees that we feel can, that show a lot of promise in terms of improvements in their vigor once we start adding water and we have these soil treatments that are gonna be part of the project. So the sort of the revised proposal to the commission is to pro provide action on the removal of 14 gold medallion trees. And then, and then to replace them in kind, because that part was missing off of the recommendation. Is that correct? Chair Clark and, and commissioners, that is correct. Um, the, the intent was to replace it a one-to-one -one with the species, uh, the gold medallion. This is on a formal approved landscape plan, and this section of State Street is also within the El Pueblo Viejo Historic District, so, so the trees will be replaced in like kind at a one-to-one -one ratio essentially per plan as they were initially installed. Thank you. Are, are there any questions for either Ms. Grant or Mr. Slack? Okay. Is there anybody from the public? Oh, Commissioner Longstreet. I'm sorry, there's a delay. I, I tried to judge it right, but. And I have, um, I don't know, jumpy fingers. Uh, <laughs> Since this project, as I understand it, is not going to construction till 2023, so removal is not going to happen till construction begins. Is that right? So this is a great opportunity to see if the amendments work. It's not a six month window. It's a two year basically window to give those trees a chance to do well, because my other concern would be if I know we had a drought, but if these trees have not done well, we have to figure out why before we just put new trees in. So I'm happy to hear that you're going to do some remediation first and make sure we have a good planting spot for that. So yeah, I, I think um, part of the part of the issue that we didn't hear about in this presentation, but that stack heard about was that Mr. Studing, the Studing the landscape architect had done some soil analysis and he found that the pH was off and there wasn't a high enough concentration of organic matter in the soil. Um, so I think that's what he was saying is why the trees weren't doing well and that's what the soil amendment would address. Well, thank you for um, addressing those issues before money spent to plant something that might not do well. Yeah. Is that, um, Mr. Slack has a question, is that the soil amendment can be done in situ? Like with the, the 14 that you're gonna, the trees, it can be done without removing them? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioners, that's correct. It's a, it's sort of a very superficial um, treatment that, that's going to incorporate organic matter um, as well as increasing the porosity of the soil, which will help with water 
percolation or just water moving down through the soil profile. Um, and it'll also help to adjust the pH to more of a, you know, functional garden sort of pH that's more conducive for plant health. And then in addition to that, as mentioned, uh, the irrigation will be rehabbed and, and be functional and it's been non-functional for, for many, many years now. So it can be, all of these treatments can be done with the existing trees, not causing any damage with the intent on probably significantly boosting the vigor of the existing trees that are remaining as part of this project. But again, just to clarify, we've reduced the number down to 14. So if the commission approves, it would be to approve the removal of the 14 gold medallion trees. Vice Chairman Gill. Thank you. Yeah, just a, a question. I just wanted to clarify when the remediation of the 10. Um, so th the funding that exists to do that immediately so that there's a good, good enough window to make sure that it's working? So, uh, yes, Chair um, Clark and uh, Commissioner McGill, that, that is something that we can look to address now within existing maintenance budgets. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, if there aren't any other questions, since I'm up, I can make a motion. Did I already ask? I think I was in the middle of asking if there was members of the public here to speak. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. No, it's okay. And then. Uh, yes, Chair Clark, we have Philip Suiting. Mr. Suiting, um, I will unmute you here and you'll have two minutes to speak. Unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, commissioners. Um, I wanted to clarify um, how we could go about amending the soil effectively, um, there, you know, and, and as immediately as possible. Um, there's quite a root mass of bougainvillea in each of the planters, so it may be difficult to um, effectively cultivate the organic matter into the you know top nine to twelve inches of soil but I certainly can work with downtown organization and public works to um, do what we can to amend the soil and perhaps even bring some temporary irrigation um, contingent upon what the budget um, allows in these first stages. So I would have to work with public works and downtown organization on that. But um, I hear what the concern is. Uh, I, you know, would hope to get that done sooner rather than later, but it may not uh, be feasible or effective since we do have the root mass. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no questions, I'll, I'll give it back to Vice Chair McGill, who is about to make a motion. Okay. Um, okay, well, I will move that we approve the revised recommendation for the removal of the 14 gold medallion trees um, to re be replaced like for like. And do I need to um, have a... I, I, are these, do these count? I, I don't believe these count as setback trees I street trees correct yeah sure Chair Clark, that's, right, that's, right, that's correct that's correct okay so you, you don't okay great I second the motion any discussion all in favor aye 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 aye, aye. aye. opposed so moved. Thank you. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the next Street Tree Advisory item for review is the request to remove a Nichols willow leafed peppermint gum, which is a street tree from the in front of the property at 2514 Castillo Street. Uh, on the application, the applicant listed general concerns with the tree, uh, prior branch failures and sidewalk disruption, as well as visibility exiting the driveway. Um, to some of you, it may be somewhat familiar. This was previously reviewed by the commission on March 22nd of 2017. 
um, at that time, obviously it was uh, denied by the commission. The committee has reviewed the application, performed a site visit, had discussion in relation to the applicants, uh, noted issues with the tree, and after a view, uh, made a recommendation to deny the removal of the subject tree located in front of 2514 Casillo Street. Thank you, Mr. Slack. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I, I would I would like to make a, a comment, I guess, if there are no questions or other questions. Trying to allow for the lag time. Um, I have a question. Uh, okay, Commissioner Longstreet. Uh, I remember from 2017, there was talk of trimming the tree. Has, uh, when was the last time that tree was trimmed? Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, I did not mention it. Uh, initially, but it was last pruned on March 5th of 2018. Uh, so in follow-up, I think, to some of the, the commission discussions and just the general maintenance of the tree, we performed a pretty extensive uh, full canopy prune back in uh, March 5th of 2018. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I know that the applicant does is concerned about the sight lines and traffic safety because of the tree. And in the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting, several members were discussing the fact that I think Public Works was of the opinion that in our city, street parking tends to be more of an issue with sight lines than the tree, than trees themselves on the street. And in this particular case, it could be cars that are the primary problem with the sight lines, not the tree. Do you remember discussions to that in effect from the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting? Chair Clark and Commissioners, um, that is correct, and, and that's consistent with discussions that I've also had with traffic engineering staff. I think maybe in a perfect scenario, you know, trees would not be close to driveway aprons, but it is something that, you know, happens in town on occasion, and this is close to the driveway apron, but again, in conversations that I've had with traffic engineering staff, vehicles parked on the street provide much more of a sightline challenge than the tree located in the parkway. And it's, it's clearly visible from this photograph that, you know, Castillo Street is a heavily parked street. Um, and those cars, no doubt, play much more of a factor in, inter in exiting the driveway than the, the Nichols Willow Leaf Peppermint Gum in the parkway. Thank you. Are there more questions? Okay. Um, if, if there are no more questions, I would like to make a motion to deny, deny the street tree removal request of the Nicole, Nicole's willow leaf peppermint gum at 2514 Castillo Street. I'll second that. Oh, you know what? I forgot to ask if there's anyone from the public that would like to speak about that. So I'll ret momentarily retract my motion. Chair Clark, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, I put my, my motion back out there and I believe that, uh, was it Commissioner Martinez Cohen? I, I couldn't tell who's It was Kathy. Oh, Vice Chair McGill. Okay. Um, so there's a motion and a second. Um, the only discussion that I have to make is that this is a, a big healthy tree and it would be, I think the neighborhood would be materialistically affected by the removal of it. Um, if there's no other discussion. Giving guys a second. Uh, yeah, I'll my only discussion would be I I do envision driving out of the parking lot and the cars, particularly with the mirror on the tree trunk. Um, the cars, I, I agree with the assessment that the cars are the greater sightline issue. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Chair Clark and commissioners, the next Street Tree Advisory recommendation for review is the request to remove a Mexican fan palm located within the front setback at 2403 Bath Street. The applicants requesting the removal of the Mexican fan palm due to large scale renovations on the parcel. Um, they're gonna be 
building a pediatric center on site, which requires the removal of the Mexican fan palm. The committee reviewed the application, performed a site visit, and after review, uh, made a recommendation to approve the removal of the Mexican fan palm. Um, just to reference, there were, there were no conditions with this removal request. The applicant provided landscape plans for the, pro the comprehensive project, and there's going to be several street trees as well as new trees that are going to be planted on the parcel itself. So the committee did not feel that there was any need to condition a replacement. Um, and then review of this item and providing the recommendation, the committee made the determination that the commission could make the finding that a reasonable and practical development of the property on which the tree is located requires its removal. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Slack? If there are no questions, I would ask whether or not there's anybody from the public that has uh, raised their hand to speak. Chair Clark, I do not see any raised hands. Okay, thank you. Um, would anybody like to make a motion? I'll make the motion to uh, approve the project as presented. I'll second. second. Based on the findings that Mr. Slack presented. Okay, uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the next Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for review is the request to remove a Coast Live Oak located within the front setback at the property at 1435 Crestline Drive. The applicants requesting the removal of the oak tree due to long-term potential damage to the neighbor's uh, retaining wall as well as their fence. The applicant identified that the tree likely germinated on its own and it's just developed in a really difficult area and long-term survival of the tree uh, without causing significant damage to the property is, is, is highly unlikely. Uh, the committee reviewed the application and after review made a recommendation to support the removal of the Coast Live Oak from the front setback. Um, and during the review, they developed a finding that the commission could make the finding that principles of good forest management will be best served by the proposed removal. There was also no condition for replacement um, for the review of this item. There's several trees on the applicant's property now, um, and the fact that this the tree likely germinated on its own, the committee didn't feel that it required a, a conditional replacement tree. Thank you, are there any questions for Mr. Slack? Okay, um, or is there anybody here from the public to speak to this particular item? Chair Clark. Excuse me, Chair Clark, I do not see any raised hands. Okay. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? Vice I Chair can McGill? do that, um, since it's just down the street from me. <laughs> Um, I move that we approve the um, recommendation as written for the removal of the Coast Live Oak at 1435 Crestline, finding that the principles of good forest management will be best served by the proposed removal. All right. Second. Okay, I hear a second. Is there any discussion? Um, okay, just because I was at this, I, well, I watched the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting, I, I do just want to emphasize um, that is a volunteer tree. It is in a very um, unlikely position for a tree, and it doesn't have a great future where it's at. Um, so with that, all in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? So moved.
Chair, Clark, and Commissioners, the next Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for review is the request to remove an evergreen ash tree and a coast live oak from the front setback located at a property at 1522 San Pasquale Street. On the application, the applicant listed a few different reasons for removal. The oak tree has developed in an area where it's very close to the, the wall and the steps and the ash tree is also in an area that can cause long-term damage and crowding of just the in just the parcel in general. Um, both trees are, are you know medium size, not fully developed, and they both have massive potential in terms of long-term growth. And you've got a very small front yard, um, but the damage, long-term damage, uh, was the the primary reason. The committee reviewed the application, performed a site visit. After review made a recommendation to approve the removal of both setback trees with the condition that the applicant work with the city arborist and plant a new tree within the setback that can achieve a mature height of 25 feet. Uh, during review, the commission, the committee determined the commission could make the finding that principles of good forest management will be best served by the proposed removals. There was lengthy discussion regarding the oak tree because it is it is a pretty nice oak tree, but after review, the the, commi the committee did feel that it would be unable to realize its full potential in the in the tight location where it, where it had been allowed to develop. Um. Thank you, Mr. Slack. Are, are there questions for Mr. Slack? Okay. Is there anybody from the public here to speak on behalf for or against these trees? Chair Clark, yes, we have one person with their hand raised. Um, one second, KK Holland. You will have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting yourself and uh, I mean, I'm unmuting you now. Un unmute yourself, please. Great, Welcome thank you. Um, thank you to the committee and uh, to staff as well. Um, I do appreciate the time that everyone is taking to um, look at this issue. Um, this was a volunteer tree, the, the oak tree. We're really sad to lose it, but as uh, staff has indicated, this is a tree that can grow quite large and uh, we believe was a volunteer tree. Um, we are totally happy to plant a replacement tree. Um, the one comment I would make is I believe in the discussion we had talked about a 20-foot tree um, and I know staff just referenced a 25-foot tree. Uh, one concern we have about this setback and tree and one of the issues that brought us to uh, both committees to begin with is the fact that this is a very small uh, front area. I don't know that you can really even call it a front yard on the west side. Uh, it's about 15 feet deep. So uh, my notes that I have from the meeting was that we were to plant one replacement tree that would reach 20 feet. Um, and that's what I've been looking into. Um, that was the only comment I had. So thank you. I appreciate and available to answer any questions you may have. Vice Chairman Um Yeah, just a question for, I think, for Mr. Slack. The difference between 20 and 25 feet, is that material in the selection of trees that would be available to the applicant in terms of um, mitigating property damage and satisfying the condition? Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, I, I don't think that the loss of five mature feet um, is really critical. Um, my the records that I have show 25 feet. I, we would have to go back and check the official record to confirm whether it was 20 or 25. I show 25. I don't think that if the commission made uh, a vote to condition the replacement of a 20 foot tree that there would be that it, there's a much critical difference between a 20 or 25 foot tree. Um, I think I've been in contact with Ms. Holland and we're gonna work together to try to find something that really makes a lot of functional sense um, given the fact that they have a very uh, small front yard. Um, so I think we're gonna try to work on the placement and choose something that's very functional. And it certainly could be something that only reaches 20 feet in maturity. Okay. And I guess the inverse would then be true that if we said 25 feet, it there could be a 25 foot tree that would also be functionally equivalent and potentially the same thing. 
Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, that's correct. I think that we could probably find a very functional species that fit either um, mature height requirement. Um, but again, I don't think that the, the committee, if, if, it, if 25 feet was the committee recommendation and the commission um, modifies it to 20, that there would be any you know, real heartburn with the issue. Okay. Well, I mean, since I'm up, I can make a motion. Before you do, um, I just wanted to, you know, I also had a really hard time with removal oak trees. So I just wanted to, Mr. Slack, could you just quickly review the discussion about the oak tree in the wall and how the oak tree can't, there's not a place for it to grow or thrive. Is that correct? Because it's, it's in a box that's too small. Chair Clark and commissioners, that's correct. There was a, there was a fairly good photograph that Ms. Holland um, submitted in with the application that showed the, the closeness of the trunk mm -hmm. to, the, to the wall um, and the stairwell as well. Um, <clears throat> as many of you know, this is a young oak tree. Um, mm -hmm. It's certainly not a baby, but it's, you know, it's, it's still juvenile. Um, and its trunk can expand for several more feet. And the trunk is literally already putting pressure against the wall and the steps, and okay. it's going to destroy things over time, and then that's going to compromise the tree's ability to really perform as well. And the committee felt that, again, the tree was a, a fantastic young specimen, and it really was unfortunate to lose the tree. As Ms. Holland herself mentioned, it just didn't make good practical sense in the long term to leave it in its existing condition and made much more sense to choose an appropriate location, plant a new tree that can be really successful and not cause lots of infrastructure conflict for the homeowner. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. Um, before I turn it back to uh, Vice Chair McGill, I did wanna thank uh, the applicant for being water wise and be friendly. I appreciate that in your application, what you've done for the urban forest in your backyard. Um, back to Vice Chair McGill. Okay, um, I will make a motion that we up the recommendation these live overgreen ash trees be removed on the condition that a fat tree be planted that can achieve a mature height of 20 feet and that the applicant work with the arb to determine location and species of tree. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Thank you. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the next Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for the review is the request to remove one Montezuma Cypress and two Coast Redwoods from the property at 3240 Campanile Drive. Um, these trees are located within the front setback of the property. On the application, the, the applicant indicated that the property is going through significant um, redevelopment. And as part of that redevelopment, they've been required to widen the driveway. Um, the two existing coast redwoods are going to be within the footprint of the newly proposed driveway. These trees have been reduced significantly in height. Um, while decent in health, the, there was an argument made that they've been poorly maintained, and that's in reference to the previous topping that occurred. The applicant expressed an interest in also resume, removing the Montezuma cypress that's located in a different part of the front setback, primarily due to crowding of an adjacent oak tree. There is a, a, a juvenile oak tree that's in close proximity to the existing uh, Montezuma cypress. The applicant is proposing to plant several new oak trees on the property as part of comprehensive landscape plans and propose the removal of the Montezuma cypress to allow for the development of the existing oak tree. The committee reviewed the application, performed a site visit, and felt that after review, there was lots of value in the Montezuma cypress. It is a fairly rare species. Um, they had mentioned that it had been reduced in height or topped, uh, but really overall, it's not that poorly maintained and has lots of potential. And the committee felt that it could coexist with the adjacent oak tree. And after uh, review made a recommendation to approve the removal of the two coast redwoods and deny the removal of the Montezuma cypress, and in reviewing this, the committee made the determination that commission 
could make the findings that both principles of good forest management will be best served by the proposed removals and that a reasonable and practical development of the property uh, requires removal of the two coast redwoods. Thank you, Mr. Slack. Are there any questions? If Vice Chair McGill. Yeah, just a quick one. I'm just noticing the, re the replacement of four oak trees. So there'd be four oak trees plus the existing plus the cypress. Um, given the discussion we just had about how big oak trees get, um, just curious what the rationale for settling on four is the number. Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, there was no um, conditions for this project given the existing landscape plans. The landscape architect is proposing those trees um, as part of comprehensive landscape redevelopment on site. And the committee yeah, felt that, you know, yeah. the committee felt that it was more than appropriate in terms of uh, offsetting the loss of the two coast redwoods. It didn't necessarily I mean, would, would you consider that a conditional approval with four oaks or just approve it as? The Chair committee, not? Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, the committee made <clears throat> the recommendation to approve the two coast redwoods and deny the removal of the right. okay. hybrids with no conditions. Okay, great, thanks. If there are no further questions, I will ask if there is anybody from the public waving their digital hand to speak. Chair Clark, I do not see any raised hands. If someone would like to speak, please raise your hand now. No raised hands. Okay, thanks. Would anyone like to make a motion? Um, I can make a motion to um, agree with this. Make a, a motion if you'd like, Chair. Um, yes, please. Concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation to approve the removal of two coast redwoods and deny the removal of a Montezuma cypress. And can we base that on the findings that uh, we meet the principles of good forest management and reasonable and practical development of property? Yes. Thanks. I will second that. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the last Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for review is the request to remove a Brazilian pepper tree located within the front setback at 1411 San Miguel Avenue. On the application, the applicant listed several reasons for the removal of the tree, uh, general decline in vigor, um, damage to the sidewalk, debris accumulation, and poor performance of plants located within the vicinity of the tree. The committee reviewed the application, performed a site visit, had discussion regarding the condition of the tree and the, the, the noted reasons for removal by the applicant. And after review, the committee <clears throat> recommended denial of the Brazilian pepper tree at 1411 San Miguel Avenue, noting that at the time of review, um, no condition, no, no findings, um, pursuant to the Santa Barbara Municipal Code 15.24.110 fit the circumstances of this request. Thank you. Um, I, I, do have an, I do have a question about this um, particular item, Mr. Slack. I, I believe it wasn't on the Street Tree Advisory Committee's printed agenda, and so not all members of the committee were able to go out and visit the tree. Is that correct, or did I miss something? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioners, it was on. It was an agendized item, so it was a formal item. Um, we do send out um, emails in addition to sending out the agenda with the locations for the the trees on the for the street tree advisory committee items. Um, mm -hmm. That was unfortunately left off of the email, but again, it was on the uh, formal agenda, so it was 
it is an agendized item and was reviewed. Right, right. It was reviewed, but not everybody went out to see it. Is that, that is right? correct. Just... It's the it it does sound it based on discussion. There were a couple members that were unable to perform a site visit. Okay. And I I do know that we as a commission went. I just um, I feel a little bit hesitant to make a recommendation or uh, to city council when not everybody on staff got to go. I don't know if I mean I could just be hypervigilant and making a problem when there isn't one. I just want to be fair to the applicant. Uh, Commissioner Longstreet. Well, I made two site visits. Um, <laughs> We uh, we received quite a bit of correspondence, and the last of it was uh, regarding views. Uh, in my 25 years, views have not been an issue that we remove a tree for. No. For personal views. Um, I was also concerned when I went, because after reading the materials, I went back today to look. And it seems to me we are going down a rabbit hole if we look at views at all. So I need you, Mr. Slack, to talk a little about it. What I saw was this Brazilian pepper is there, but then there is a giant, is that a stone pine next to it um, on the next property over that is an absolutely phenomenal tree. What happens when that one goes? Because that's blocking someone's view. Down from this Brazilian pepper are I think three more substantial sized trees on the property plus a giant palm tree. It just seems like we're going down a very slippery slope. So could you speak to that for me? As Chair Clark, <coughs> Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, when the both the Street Tree Advisory Committee and the Parks and Recreation Commission are reviewing setback trees for removal, we rely on the findings that are outlined in the city's municipal code in making determinations for the removal of trees. There does not exist a finding that addresses view related issues and trees are not subject to that. Trees are not setback trees are not subject to that as a result of there being no findings for removal. Um, if there was a view related issue between the homeowner that where the tree resides and an adjacent property owner, somebody within the vicinity, the city does have the view dispute resolution ordinance process which is a, a, an ordinance that was passed as a tool and to provide a functional path towards some working solution between private property owners. But the Street Tree Advisory Committee, the commission and, and staff do not get involved with that process. So when evaluating setback trees for removal, view is not a criteria that's evaluated. And then we received a letter from Public Works that they're blocking the sidewalk. That's more of a lifting of the branches item, isn't it? Not anything to do with the tree blocking um, pedestrian views or driver's views or any of that, correct? Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, that's correct. Um, Public Works will send notices to private property owners if vegetation is affecting either the roadway or the public sidewalk. In this case, the letter that was circulated after the review of the item by the committee uh, did indicate that it was a little low over the road and a little low over the sidewalk and that and Public Works was requesting that the homeowner trim the tree uh, so that there was adequate pedestrian clearance on the sidewalk and vehicular clearance over the road. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Is there anybody here from the, the public to speak to this agenda item? Uh, Chair Clark, yes, I see one hand raised. If anyone else would like to speak, um, we have two hands raised right now. And if anyone else would like to speak, then um, please raise your hand now. The first hand that I see raised is for Mar Ms. Martha Gebhardt. Ms. Gebhardt, I will unmute you now. You will have two minutes, unmute yourself. You'll have two minutes to speak. Welcome. Ms. Gebhardt, un unmute yourself on the on the panel. Can you tell if she's on a phone or a computer? Can we help her find the mute button? 
Hold on a second. I don't know why I'm there. Hi. There we go. Hi, I'm Martha Gephardt. I live I live across the street from 1411. I'm at 1418. Um, I'm hopeful that the uh, uh, commissioners received my uh, photos and letter dated, I believe, July 8th. Um, I'd like to comment directly on the recommendations made by the committee. Um, first, uh, it says that um, they found the tree in good health and was well maintained. Um, this tree hasn't been maintained in the last three years. And as a result, as you could see from the photos, it has been has blocked my view. Um, in the letter that I emailed, it um, I've been in, on this property for 28 years, and that at that time the tree was just a tiny little thing, and um, I had unobstructed views. But over the years, um, it's grown, and we put over the years, thousands and thousands of dollars trying to maintain this tree. And it's just um, gotten too costly that we, we can no longer maintain it. Um, between the family, the Oaklands and myself, we have six kids that we support. And um, I think it'd be easier just to, you know, have the tree removed and, re and have a, a replacement tree. Um, Lastly, I'm um, looking at the ordinance that Nathan had mentioned, the 22.76120. Um, I became aware of that uh, not too long ago and approached the Oaklands and um, about this issue. And they were been more than willing to help me um, maintain my view. And I just asked you to help me to maintain my view as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gephardt. I believe there's another speaker. Hello. Hi, welcome. Um, Hi. Can you state your name? Hi, my name is Mary O'Flynn, and I Hi, am Mary. the homeowner at 1411 San Miguel. Um, thank you to the committee and staff for coming out and to observe our tree. It's um, one of the, this tree has been kind of massive it's a little too massive for us now it's it's very big it's hard to maintain it's expensive to maintain there's um the drought tolerant plants that we planted below the pepper tree on our hill do not grow or thrive because i think pepper leaves drop droppings are like very acidic that's what my gardener said and so we're having a hard time with that um there is um the the tree is also causing um the sidewalk to lift and i in the picture that i sent you guys there is a um, about an inch thick um rays from the, and the concrete from the roots of our pepper tree on both sides and it's caused um a couple of different accidents with uh children with scooters and skateboards on our street so i have some concerns about that that it will continue to raise and um i would really hope that you guys can consider <laughs> our uh um, request to re for removal of this tree. And we were, are willing to replace the tree. We are also willing to donate a tree to the city. Um, you know, anything that could help would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That brings it back to the commission. Um, does anyone have any questions of uh, Ms. O'Flynn? All right. Um, Ms. Oh, Vice Chair McGill. Um, well, what I guess a comment on the sidewalk lifting um, that obviously can be an issue here. Unfortunately, it's an issue in so many places that we would have probably have no trees left if we um, took them out for sidewalk liftings. Unfortunately, um, the I guess I'm still confused about this view ordinance. The way mm -hmm. I read and, and and how that actually works with respect to the findings that we can make on tree removals, which th there seems to be almost an inherent conflict here. Um, and I guess reading that ordinance, it it reads it certainly reads as something where 
the conflicting or potentially conflicting parties work together and there's a series of steps to go through with tree removal being absolutely the last step. Um, and, and this is a way, and the ordinance is there for guidance and the pamphlet's there for guidance. Can, can you help me understand that a little bit better? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, <clears throat> Uh, in, a, in a lot of these coastal communities where views are really prized, um, Santa Barbara has lots of, you know, view shed related issues. And uh, several years ago, due to lots of conflict between private property owners, this ordinance was developed, again, as a tool, a uh, functional tool to try to come up with some resolution, again, between two private property owners that have a view related issue. And as you noted, within that ordinance is a hierarchy of restorative orders where you have some strategies that can be employed in terms of pruning um, with removal being the, you know, the sort of the last straw in the approach. But again, going back to the Street Tree Advisory Committee's review and the Commission's review of setback trees, view is not a, a consideration. So in determining whether or not a, a setback tree satisfies a finding for removal within the city's Tree Preservation Ordinance, which is in Chapter 15.24, so it's in a different chapter. Um, there's no view-related findings. So when the commission looks at this tree, view is, is just simply not a characteristic that's evaluated. Again, if the Gebhards and the O'Flins wanted to utilize the view dispute resolution process to try to come up with a solution to restore a view, they could do so, but the city does not get involved with that process. So if it got down to the last resort, and you're saying the city doesn't get involved, but you have an ordinance that clearly says removal is possible, how, how does that circle get squared? Ms. Zachary, I see you up. Uh, sure. Chair Clark, and Commissioner McGill, I'm not certain that there's ever been a removal as a result of the view dispute resolution process. I'm not sure if Ms. Zachary has more thorough knowledge if there ever really has been a removal. Um, it is important to note that the view dispute resolution ordinance covers lots of other trees outside of setback trees. Exactly. Chair Clark, Commissioner McGill, the view dispute resolution ordinance is really for the purpose of private parties to work out their considerations related to one party's tree and the view of another party's tree. It doesn't come into play when it has to do with the city regulated tree. So if you can imagine that someone may have a backyard tree that grows to a height or a structure that impedes a view of a private party, the view dispute resolution ordinance gives a framework within which for them to try to come to a resolution and it does not involve the city at all in that decision making process. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Zachary. Um, Commissioner Longstreet, I saw you pop up for a second and then you disappeared. Did you? No. So I, yeah, I was going to say the same. The way I understand it is there are trees that are regulated by city ordinance, setback trees and street trees. And there are a number of trees within the city that people have disputes about that we do not engage in. And that was my concern was that we were applying something that we really hadn't, what they were trying, something was trying to be applied that wasn't applicable to this particular tree was all okay. right so i mean just to sum this up mr slack to remove a setback tree we have to meet one of the five findings for setback tree removal correct which is in 15 24090 chair clark and commissioners that is correct and during review of this particular species of tree um, with at 1411 San Miguel, the committee made the determination that none of the findings within that section of the ordinance uh, fit the circumstances of this request. Right. So for, for clarification for um, the applicants or anybody else listening to remove a setback tree, 
you have to make the finding that it's serving the principles of good forest management. It's reasonable and practical development of property. Um, you have to prove that the character of the immediate neighborhood would not be materially affected by the proposed removal. You have to prove, or you have to prove that the topography of the building site renders remover des removal desirable, or that the safety of person or uh, property dictates the removal. And in this case, none of the street tree advisory committee members when reviewing the information found any of these findings for removal. Right. With that, if there are no other questions, uh, we could entertain a motion. Uh, Commissioner um, I, Street. I would move that we concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation to deny removal at 1411 San Miguel Avenue. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Under discussion, I would just add that I, I like I said, I made two site visits out there. I see mm -hmm. this as being a pretty slippery slope with the other trees on that downhill side that are beautiful and add definitely to the neighborhood. And that I did not see um, a rising in the sidewalk that that rose to that level. It's um, it was less than half an inch. It was you know I mean I did look at all aspects of this request. And when you speak of slippery slope, what you're talking about is precedent and the precedent of removing a tree because it blocks a view or because it lifts a sidewalk. Um, and I see I see other trees on that property that would fit that same bill and on the neighboring property that we could um, find that whole area denuded for that. We've gone through the same issue mm -hmm. on the um, Riviera mm -hmm. and um, it does substantially change the neighborhood. And environmentally, we know right now this is um, a, a dangerous way to go. So. Those are my opinions. Thank you. And I agree with those opinions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? So moved. Uh, thank you, Mr. Slack. Welcome, Ms. Zachary. Uh, this brings us to our director's report. Chair Clark and members of the commission, um, <clears throat> despite the pandemic that we're in the middle of, as you learned in your last commission meeting, the Parks and Recreation Department has been very busy, uh, most particularly since your last meeting. Uh, we had the 4th of July. Uh, which is often an extremely uh, popular destination for many people south of Santa Barbara, including many community members in Santa Barbara. And as a result, there was significant concern regarding what that would mean in terms of the safety and the potential spread of the coronavirus. Uh, as a result of that concern, the county health officer did um, move to close uh, Santa Barbara's beaches for that long weekend. And as part of that closure, the city took a number of steps, uh, which many of us are familiar with in terms of closing the beachfront parking lots um, and, and basically stipulating what people could and couldn't do in our beach areas and in our beachfront parks, essentially allowing people to engage in recreation that involved moving along, uh, that did not involve uh, picnicking or barbecuing or spending any time in a sedentary position where groups of people could potentially congregate. So I'd just like to review with you some of the things that, that we did as a department. The 4th of July is always a big weekend for us because we put out tons of trash cans, we've got more staff on, there's lots of people around, 
Uh, the fireworks are definitely something that's a that are a huge draw. And we anticipated that there would still be some amount of draw and we wanted to be sure that, that people were safe that did come out to the beaches. So um, despite the fact that the fireworks had been canceled, uh, we ended up planning almost as if it was a traditional 4th of July plus some. In terms of the lifeguards that we had on duty, we doubled the number of lifeguards that we had. Uh, we ensured that all of our park rangers were working the entire weekend. We increased our staff uh, in our parks division on the Friday, the Saturday, and the Sunday to make sure that we could continue supporting restroom services and trash services. And also in the event that there would be more people than we anticipated. I asked uh, everybody in the department to tally up the hours. We spent 812 staff hours, um, which is almost a half time equivalent staff person. And although that seems like a lot, it was the right thing to do um, for the community. And then also it really gave us the opportunity to do the kind of outreach that people uh, want us to do all the time, but we don't have the resources in terms of encouraging people uh, to socially distance, to wear their masks, uh, reminding them they could not hang out on the beach this weekend, that we were all in an emergency mode and we needed to band together. Uh, so I'd just like to say that it was one of those um, weekends where we have lots of plans in place that we've been doing 4th of July for many years. Uh, within 24 hours, we had ramped up our efforts, increased our signage, and staffed the whole weekend. And as a result, uh, most people that if they spend any time in the beachfront areas, it, it actually seemed like it was going as well as it could. I'd also like to acknowledge that we work closely with the Waterfront Department, the Santa Barbara Police Department, the Public Works Department, um, and the Fire Department. Everybody plays a role in trying to manage a community um, during a all the time, obviously, but then also during a holiday weekend. And then I just like to highlight some facility improvement and capital projects. And we have a few slides to show you, mostly because we um, aren't gonna provide you with a full capital improvement status report right now, but we'll be back in the coming months um, asking for the commission's recommendation and guidance on some of the other projects we're working on. And even though uh, we've been responding to the pandemic for the last four months, uh, we had some projects that were underway. And so we used the opportunity uh, with closed facilities to continue advancing them. And, and in some respects, that work needed to occur because it was grant funded. And so we did not wanna lose the potential to support our facilities uh, with grant funding. So if I could have the next slide, please. So Bonnet Park, um, our beloved park on the west side has a restroom with wonderful murals on it. Uh, it, um, it was sorely in need of a renovation. The city received a community development block grant fund grant uh, last year to go towards the full scale renovation of the park. Um, the commission has seen that grand plan with picnic areas, pathways, a multi-sport court, um, improvements to the turf field. Uh, given where we were with the project funding and that we did not, we had not yet secured the rest of the funding for the project, we chose to go ahead and at least complete the restroom renovation. So we used that solely 140,000 of community development block grant funds to complete the interior renovations. If I could have the next slide, please. And as we are familiar with many of our park restrooms, we have a standard design that we find works really well in terms of the type of flooring, the type of tiling, also the partitions. These are um, easily cleaned, uh, should be have great endurance, um, and also uh, be much more pleasant than what we used to have. As we found with many of our park restroom renovations, uh, what used to be okay for a two-stall restroom, given today's ADA standards, are now become really mostly a one-stall restroom. So in some cases, we lose some space, but at the same time, we bring those restrooms up to code and um, make them more accessible for everybody in the public. Could I have the next slide, please? And then I want to highlight Chase Palm Park Center. Uh, this is a project that was funded in the fiscal year 20 budget. It's a project uh, that was identified for funding using facilities division funds. Uh, as the commission will recall, every year uh, the department contributes funds 
to the facilities division for both the maintenance and the renewal of our facilities. And so a fund is created and funds are allocated by department depending on what the need is. Uh, the need for Chase Palm Park was significant. Uh, the interior carpet, the paint, everything, sort of the features were dated. Uh, we also needed to make improvements to the HVAC and the lighting system. This project got underway just as COVID was getting underway. Uh, the benefits that we achieved with this project is that a lot of the work could be done by facilities division staff, uh, which are paid for out of those funds. Uh, so it made it easier. They had time on their hands. We could advance this project. Um, I'm really pleased to show you a couple of pictures and I can't wait to let you inside because we strive not only just to do the standard upgrades, but to really try to make improvements that responded to what we had heard from our facility users, both the folks that have private events there, but when we have an event there, and then also uh, information and, and ideas that we got from the hospitality community and the, um, uh, the catering community of how we could make this a more usable facility. So in addition to new ceiling paint, carpet, lighting. Uh, we've upgraded the kitchen, which really meant simplifying the kitchen in terms of taking out all the old cabinets and putting in basic improvements that really support a catering. And then also creating, um, opening up the building interior to create more light and to provide increased functionality. So if I could have the next slide. Thank you. So this gives you a view of the project under construction, no ceiling. Uh, no flooring. You can see a little bit about how we have uh, removed some of the doors. In the slide uh, to, I hope, your left, you'll see a, a, a light opening. There used to be doors that led out into the sunroom. And to the right, you can see the edge of an opening. Um, and that actually leads out into the entry hall area. If I could have the next slide. So this gives you a view of what it looks like today. And um, if you had been in there recently, and many of us have been in there many times, uh, it was kind of dark. It was sort of pink and green, and it really didn't lend itself to a, a space that was really usable. So on the right-hand side of the photograph, you can see the entry doors, which lead to uh, Cabrillo Boulevard. And then on the left-hand side, you can see where we no longer have doors and it goes right out into that sunroom. And during our investigation of the building, we realized that we could actually not only remove the doors, but we could raise the height of them because there was built in um, uh, uh, framing for those doors. So there's more headroom, more space as you walk in. We have new lighting. Um, we have a new lighting system on the left-hand side be difficult to remember, but there used to be a door that went into a hall. We actually filled that in to make it more usable. And then the new carpet um, we developed and, and installed that'll make it a more modern um, amenity contemporary building once we are able to actually use it again. If I could have the, and I just like to add, um, we also uh, working with Public Works uh, added air conditioning which one might think, oh, why would you need that next to the beach? Well, sometimes you don't, but there's also a lot of noise that comes from Cabrillo Boulevard. And there can be noise outside of the building on the grassy area. And so sometimes people really want to have a more private event without having to open the doors for cooling. Mm -hmm. We are working on some upgraded landscaping and that will be done by the Parks Division staff. And then also a formal fence that will better delineate the outdoor space and help us manage it so that we have reduced misuse in the area and those those improvements will be coming this summer. I think that was the last the last slide. Um, Matt Parker, Parks Manager, will go into the Plaza Veracruz renovation. Uh, we're taking advantage of this downtime as well to implement some changes at that park that are important uh, to reestablish more active recreation safe uses there. And then I'd also like to briefly mention, I indicated that we started with uh, the restroom renovation for Bonnet Park. Uh, we still have some CDBG funds, and then we're also partnering with the Creeks Division. They'll be doing a stormwater improvement project underneath the turf at Bonnet Park. So <laughs> although this renovation project is not fully funded, we are taking the bits and pieces that we still have available in funding and coupling those 
with the creeks work and we hope to be initiating construction of some improvements this fall, which will provide improvements for park users as well. So to include improved turf once the stormwater uh, projects in and improved uh, pathways and access and then also improved picnic areas. So a little bit of the work will advance and uh, hopefully one day we'll get to finish the project. And then lastly, um, as part of your um, budget presentation, I mentioned that we have both community development block grant funds and measure C funds to pursue the interior, the exterior, excuse me, improvements uh, to the Louise Lowry Davis Center. It's a project we've been working on for three years, um, although it's not fully funded as well. Uh, it'll give us an opportunity to enhance the ex outdoor spaces of this facility, uh, which we're likely to be able to use sooner rather than the indoor spaces. And then lastly, Eastside Neighborhood Park has been an area of concern for the department. Uh, we started talking last summer about what we could do for improvements to that park and uh, discourage the type of activity that's going there. We have some funding for the restroom renovation. We will be looking at ways to try to match this funding and make other improvements to the park, uh, working in collaboration with other city departments and responding to some key concerns that we've received from the neighborhoods. Opportunity to improve that space. Again, focusing on some outdoor spaces too, since um, those are more easily and readily used, uh, particularly as the community moves through the pandemic. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Wow. Um, after that concise yet comprehensive report, I just, what really strikes me is all the different kinds of funding you're using right now to move forward. Instead of being abandoning ship, you're, you're building resiliency by taking what you can to do what you can right now. And I, I'm just really grateful that you have the, the, the motivation to do so. Thank, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Longstreet. I'd just like to express my appreciation of staff for 4th of July, everyone who um, went to work and made that happen. The ability to let people recreate at our beaches and not congregate, I think was a wonderful compromise and people really appreciated it in the public. So thank you to everyone who makes it and who's working every day because different things are happening in our parks that um, we're not used to. Well, some of them we're used to, but it's happening in a more intense way. And um, our staff stands up to meet these needs daily. So um, please express our support. And I really hope as we move forward in this budgeting process, those hours that we somehow find if, if money's coming down from the federal government for some, uh, that we get reimbursed for some of that so that we don't have to take it out of our regular parks maintenance and you know keep adjusting, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So thank you to everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Zachary. Well, um, that brings us to our parks division report. Welcome, Mr. Parker. Good evening, Chair Clark and commissioners. Um, today, the item that I'm going to be presenting is uh, is um, on on what the parks division has been doing throughout this um, our COVID response, and just kind of wanted to highlight some of the um, projects that we have been working on. At, um, recently so um without further ado we could move on um, next slide please the coronavirus um, pandemic it really has highlighted you know the central role that we at the parks and recreation department have in providing you know good recreation opportunities to local um, community in this time of crisis um, the department as a department we quickly recognized this importance this important and and the um, parks and recreation outdoors, um, the benefit that we have for the community for the physical and um, mental well-being, and and we did our best to keep a commitment to keep our parks, trails, and beaches open throughout this, so we could support that that need. Um, 
being an essential service, uh, the parks division remained, you know, in active um, status, and we quick, quickly initiated um, measures to ensure public and employee safety through specialized training and coronavirus awareness, um, personal protective um, and sanitation protocols. Um, staff also um, immediately implemented um, closures of facilities, amenities, where there was high risk of person-to-person -person contact, such as playgrounds, fitness equipment, um, basketball courts, and sports fields. Um, staff also closed a few select parks and restrooms to redirect our limited resource to other needed areas. And um, we included um, extra restroom cleaning and sanita sanitation. Um, next slide, please. Um, staff has remained um, positive and extremely flexible to the rapid changes and adjustments um, to the work environment. Um, and the plants have been, you know, changing uh, daily, it seems. And staff's really responded and, and they, they, they've been reporting to work reliable reliably and um despite despite their fears of the pandemic uncertainties and worries of being exposed to the virus so um yeah citywide elimination of the hourly our hourly um, position positions also compounded with position vacancies also um was a concern they worked through that they um that, that with having that elimination of the hourly position, it instigated another challenge for our work staff um, where we uh, had to change um, around work schedules to cover for weekends. So um, it was it was a lot of a lot of um, doing by our, our our staff, you know, a lot of adjustments and they really um, persevered and, and, and pushed through and really um, you know, stepped up to the plate. Um, and then with our Rangers, uh, gosh, uh, with the significant um, increase of public use of um, city parks, beaches and trails, um, the park Rangers have, have been paramount in supporting and assisting, assisting our staff with, with um, managing our resources. Um, the, the public use this uptick in public um, use to our, our facilities has required constant and focused response from from our park rangers. Um, they have been on the forefront every day enforcing, educating the public regarding the allowed activities, homelessness, and social and social distancing. In addition, they have been extremely helpful with staff when um, staff needs help, for example, um, posting signage. Um, throughout this whole pandemic, staff has been out there with, uh, you know, creating outreach through signage. You know, I had a sign campaign. You know, every time it's, it seemed like we were posting, uh, and initially when, when, the, when we declared emergency, it seemed like every other day there was a new order or or um, health uh, restriction that came out, and we had to get the word out and and uh, get signage out there so we could uh, help the public be aware of what what they need to do to be safe within the park. So um, they were they were very helpful with it, um, adding extra support in that. Um, they educated and reminded park users of the ever-changing state and local county health orders regarding the current regulations. Um, and like Ms. Jack, Ms. Zachary uh, mentioned, uh, their their support at the Fourth of July was it was um, it was very helpful. Um, they they. The Fourth of July had shown like further important complex to enforcing, you know, during this pandemic. 
and the value of the, the ranger program. Um, between the rangers and the beach lifeguards, they, they had collectively made 3,000 contacts over the holiday weekend with park and beach goers providing enforcement and information regarding county, county health order for the beach closure. Um, here's a, here's kind of uh, how we structured our staffing on for the 4th of July weekend. The third, the, um, July 3rd, we focused on site preparation, signposting. Um, Saturday, uh, July 4th, we upstaffed and the anticipation of large beach crowds. And on the 5th um, following, we upstaffed in, uh, in the anticipation of large cleanup. Um, so we were prepared. We didn't know what to expect with, with, uh, with the whole pandemic and the beach closures. We were expecting large crowds co to come up from, from the south, and we weren't sure how we were going to deal with stuff. But um, all in all, uh, despite, you know, we, we, uh, we had to make a lot of contacts. The, the rangers were very busy. Um, patrolling and, and policing the, the, the beach area. But all in all, it, it was a success. I think everyone, like um, um, Commissioner Longstreet mentioned, um, all in all, I think the community really appreciated, you know, our efforts and, and the fact that that um, they were still able to, to get out and recreate at some degree. At some degree. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Here's some of the sample. Uh, here's an example of some of the signage that we had to put out. Um, this 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 is a uh, pretty consistent of the whole beachfront. We placard um, that the whole beachfront probably putting out anywhere from 250 to 300 signs from shoreline to to East Beach. Um, it was it was quite an effort um, with staff and and the rangers. Um, and this, this is kind of consistent, what you see throughout the parks. We, we have, um, signs that, that, uh, that we have out for the public for, you know, so they, they, they're aware of, um, you know, circumstances of, of the health orders and, and restrictions we have. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, um, despite many of the challenges that we've, we've faced um, resulting from the COVID-19 response, staff remain dedicated and positive, um, pushing through normal daily work duties, and plus launching some special projects uh, to maintain forward momentum in achieving department and um, initiatives and goals. Um, so one of the, one of the, uh, the projects that we recently embarked on was the Plaza Veracruz uh, renovation. Um, our goal here was to better serve the community, discourage um, park misuse, and invite and encourage opportunities for positive park use. This is a site that we had constantly had issues with and worked with um, with the police department and the neighborhood um, task force for several years, trying to find solutions to manage the loitering um, and misuse that, that happens at the park. So um, with this project, we we um, removed the playground. Um, next slide, please. Um, we removed the playground and walkway leading up to the playground and installed the temporary fencing around it to, to, to allow for a secure place where contractors and, and staff could work safely. Um, we also, in doing this, we, uh, did some planter renovation where we, um, we renovated approximately 13,000 square feet of planter, which was overgrown by, um, by invasive weed, um, grassy weed species, such as Cocuya grass and, and Bermuda. And then, um, we had the tree, uh, tree crew come in and do some tree pruning. And later, later slides will show that work in progress. Um, 
And then we also are beginning the irrigation and landscape modifications right now to to bring that that space to a, a usable space. We're gonna we're fill we've already filled in the area where the um, the playground was removed, and now we're in the process of uh, um, adding irrigation, modifying it to to um, so you, so we have good coverage for the irrigation, so we could support dirt, turf growth there. Um, next slide. Um, here's some here's a before and here's an after picture. We've opened up. You could see kind of. On the other side of that tree, on your on the left slide, there is where the the playground was, and it it just opens up that space there, so we could you know program it for for recreation activities, you know. Uh, so it, it it just gives a more usable space, um, eliminates that area where where we had a lot of problems with um, the homelessness um, loitering. Um, so it, it'll, it'll it'll benefit the the um, the community. Hopefully, we'll encourage um, positive play there and um, get the public uh, back into the park visiting. Next slide, please. Here's a here's here's a slide of uh, during the demolition of the playground. Um, next slide, please. Another one for the demo. Um, next slide. And then here's our tree crews working in the trees. Um, they they serviced every tree in that park. Um, it hasn't it hasn't uh, been pruned for approximately um, I, I believe it was like eight years. So it was much needed, and it it really opened up the the park and and improve the the tree health um it was it, it was well needed and we also were able to get around the um the quiet's building to the north off of um coda street so that that we took advantage of the opportunity since they there was no um preschool in session to, to do that work so it worked out great next slide please Oak Park. Um, okay, this this uh, park, th this um, project was the um, the renovation of the landscape around the the tennis courts at Oak Park. Um, the the enhancements we did we did were kind of in conjunction with um, recreations um, resurfacing project. Um, the, the the primary goal was to en enhance enhance the landscape, but also to mitigate the the weeds and gopher and erosion issues that we had were encountering there next slide please here you see uh uh before um before a uh, photo on your on your left and this is the northern side of the um, tennis court and then the the after is the finished project project um, project with the surfacing and and our cleanup of the the um, landscape around there. Next slide, please. Here's uh, the progression of of the project. This is the north side that I I pointed out earlier on the previous slide that um that was just had a lot of slough that had eroded into the this little channel here that we cleared out um, on the north side. What we did here is we we excavated it below the grade of the um, the the tennis court slab and we added um, hardware cloth to to prevent a gopher intrusion and we also applied um, weed barrier and then on the next slide you'll see the rock work that the staff staff did next slide please here's the rock work as we, we we began from the the top down towards the creek area of the the um parcel here um we had a, we had all this rock and it was surplus rock left over from another project that we were able to utilize so we just we 
we had the a lot of the material already in in possession, so it w really didn't cost the, the the division much in in materials. A lot of it was already stuff we had. Um, next slide, please. Here's another um, picture of staff working um, on the. This would be the west side, the west side of the the court where you enter off from the parking lot, and there's a a, a stacked rock, a river rock um, retaining wall there that had. It it was just riddled with um, with gopher activity, and it was the the dirt had had pushed out and was was overflowing onto the um, the court here. And what staff did is there's a, actually you'll see kind of at the toe of, of that, that wall, there's a little uh, kind of a, a, a little ditch area that is designed to, to move water off the court. And that was completely filled in. And it, we, it, it it looked like it had just been a planter, but it is actually an asphalt kind of like trough. So we exposed that and then um, applied the same methods for um, for controlling the, the gophers with the hardware cloth and then on top of that with the weed fabric. And then they topped it with the, the decorative river rock, as you see on the slide to the, the right. Next slide, please. Here's some more pictures of the work in progress. Next slide, please. Okay, I'd, just, um, I'd like to highlight some of the forestry projects that um, that are either in pro are either completed or in process or in planning. Um, the palm pruning at Alameda and Alice Keck Park. Those were the um, that was the the, the pruning of the all the the canary um, island pine uh, palm trees, and there was approximately seventy nine of those that were pruned. Um, it that was uh, we had that contracted out, um, and then we have the um, ficus trees at the Alameda Park that we are planning on doing some. Um, some additional work on there to improve their health. I'll explain that a little more in the, the next couple slides. And then the Morton Bay um, historic uh, um, ficus tree at at, um, at at the down there by the um, railroad station. Um, th this is a, a a tree that's kind of been in a little state of decline. The 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 forestry um, um, section already begun a mulching program of this tree to increase increase the organic matter and nutrient nutrient cycling um, uh, under the tree to kind of add um, organic matter and and introduce uh, um, nitrogen through through the breakdown of the the mulch and also it it, it aids in uh, in in holding um, moisture in. Um, in addition to the mulching staff, you know, we're developing a long-term um, strategy to a, um, to programmatically utilize a fun fungicidal applications to control the presence of Phytophthora. That's a, um, a disease that, that's that's plaguing this tree. Um, it's been it's been uh, affected for many years now. We've we've treated it before, but um, we were seeing. It more in the state of decline, so we we want to initiate that that app, those applications again. Um, the strategy will be presented to the IPM committee um, for approval in August, um, and and with with uh, with this uh, the programmed um, applications of the fungicide, it's consistency is key. It's something we got to continue and do it on a like a programmed a regular basis um, it, we're, we're looking at uh, uh, retaining this this beautiful historic tree for a long time and we want to take the necessary steps uh, that is necessary to to achieve that um, next slide please 
Here's uh, here's uh, some slides of the after um, the Canary Island pine or palm trees were pruned. Um, on the left, you have Alice Clack and Alameda on the right. Um, as part of, of this effort, um, forestry implemented a new approach to pruning these palms with the use of hand tools only, um, as well as sanitizing the the the, the saw and hand tools um, between each each tree to minimize the transmission of harmful fun, fungal pathogens that can rap, rapidly kill these trees. Um, these trees are, are very old and we wanted to protect them, so we, we took those measures uh, to, to ensure that um, they're, they're beautiful trees and we, we just wanted to do everything we could to, to make sure that it, that they were didn't contract the, any kind of um, fungal pathogens. So, um, next slide, please. Um, during this fiscal year, um, these these um, trees at Alameda Park, these old um, ficus trees that are located on the on uh, adjacent to Garden Street. It's right where the the large picnic um, group area has been for many years. And on the left hand side, you can see kind of right underneath the canopy of that tree, the that kind of a dead kind of barren area. Well, that's that's like that for a reason. It's just so heavily compacted, um, and that's and there was once a tree, kind of right in the middle of that area that, that had declined in, and died some years back. But um, what, what we're planning on doing uh, with these trees are, uh, forestry is gonna be in, implementing new um, strategies to focus on the health of these trees. Um, and, and part of it is some cultural practices. We're, we're planning on removing the, um, all the turf from underneath the canopies and we'll, um, forestry will be doing some radial trenching um, through there with an, a newly acquired air spade that they, they, they just recently purchased. Um, what, what they'll do is they'll be cut, loosening the soil and reducing the compaction um, with this tool to help promote um, air and oxygen and water exchange with the soil and, and the roots. Um, ultimately trying to improve the, the, the overall health of them. And in addition, we'll be removing all the turf, like I said, and um, applying mulch within this area. Um, next slide, please. Here's a map of the general area of these, where these uh, canopies are of this ficus tree. That red area is the area that we're plant we're proposing to to fence off and and do this work in. Um, we it it'll it'll uh, we plan on kicking it off sometime um, in September. Um, but in the interim, um, staff um, park staff will be working with forestry staff to remove that turf and um, adjust some irrigation that is in that area. Um, next slide, please. So this brings me to uh, some good news that we recently received. Uh, in early July, uh, the department received the approval to rehire um, critical, um, critical staff to support both forestry operations and the parks. And so we, right now we have the, the senior tree trimmer um, recruitment that we'll be um, actually interviewing for next week. Um, and then we have two grounds maintenance worker um, positions that we will look at um, interviewing for on the first week of August. So we're really excited about that. We've, we've been short staffed for quite a while in these positions and and we're just uh, grateful that, that we're able to 
move forward with these and and get some uh, get these positions filled because it's it it you know staffs has been managing, but it you know it really will be beneficial and helpful for us to get all the staff in that we can. And um, that concludes my my presentation. Do you have any questions? Uh, Commissioner Longstreet. Um, I don't have any questions, but I do want to say I really appreciate the report on the trees and what you're doing to for the health of those trees. Um, thank you so much. Thank, to, thank you to all the staff. And I am very impressed with what has been accomplished during this time when um, when you are short step, when you've been missing your hourlies for a while and things got jumbled around and there's extra duties to see what you've accomplished at Oak Park and uh, your, your other projects. Um, really appreciate all everyone's hard work. Mm -hmm. And uh, my cat is now making an appearance. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, that's all very heartening to see. I, I did have a quick question. Maybe you maybe you covered it. Um, with the recruitments for the grounds maintenance workers and the tree trimmer, are you yes. did you are you giving people who have been laid off who are qualified but perhaps were laid off from a different position the right of first refusal? Um, we actually prior to to the shutdown and the hiring freeze, um, we at our we were in the process of of setting up interviews. And we've already we already had a list that was generated um, through the the process, so we were just we're just going off of that list. We fired back most of our um, our hourly em employees already, and some of them are included in the list. The ones that have had it applied are just the ones that qualified and and did apply are on the are on the list to to interview. So. So, mm -hmm. I did want to echo um, Commissioner Longstreet's comments and um, just such appreciation for what you guys are doing in these COVID times because as I mentioned the last couple of meetings you guys mm -hmm. really are the park department is essential to the health of this community right now when we have no place to go um, and you're giving us that place and you're doing what you can to make it better or at least not worse than than it was uh, before we started all this so um, thank you to you and to your staff that keep keep our community what it is it. yeah that, that's one of the challenges uh being a, being a, in the parks uh the grass doesn't stop growing you know it's mm -hmm. stuff we have to manage and the trees uh, still need re require work uh we still gonna have branch failures so so staff i, I really like to give them a lot of kudos for all all their their hard work and you know it wasn't it wasn't easy they, they there was a lot of uh you know uncertainty at, at first and, and and worries and um you know, they showed up and they worked and they 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 did their job you know they they didn't complain so i just like to give my hats you know and take my hat off to them and, and thank them for that so and i'll echo your your uh remarks on that as well um chair clark and Commissioner Longstreet. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, um, we can move on to, um, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Clark, I do have a comment. All right, Commissioner Perry. I'm interested in what measures you have taken to um, curb the loitering in Vera Cruz Park and have they been successful? um the what we've done is i mean it was ironic that w the day that we we went to set up the temporary fence we've only we only had one person vagrant hanging out there we just moved them along but um yeah it, it's kind of been interesting throughout um this whole covid response I, like prior to that 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 park would be packed with with homeless um homeless individuals 
and then the, for a while they seemed to go away. They, I, we, we were, I talked with the Rangers several on several occasions, and we weren't sure what happened. And maybe they they got some housing, or maybe they were put into a program. But uh, we did we have seen a, a little bit of a decrease there. Um, and then it's you know it kind of has its eb, ebbs and flows. And but uh, yeah, there hasn't been as much activity there in the you know lately which was perfect you know gave us the opportunity to get in there and do some work that really needed to happen so um yeah there there hasn't been really anything that we had done to to mitigate that it just kind of was how things played out thank you You're welcome Anybody else? All right, thank you, Mr. Parker. Thank you, Chair Clark. All right. So we, we've come to the annual advisory committee reports, um, which we receive every year. And I believe this is just for information. I We can have a discussion if we want, but there's not an actual presentation unless I'm mistaken. Is, is that correct, Rose? Chair Clark, that is correct. That is for information only. Okay. Um, so did anybody have any questions on these annual advisory committee reports? Okay. Um, if there are no questions about that, we can move on to the election of chair and vice chair, which, which is for action. Um, commissioner, um, actually vice, vice chair McGill. Well, um, commissioner Longstreet, um, was a few nanoseconds ahead of me. <laughs> okay, Com Commissioner uh, Longstreet. Just uh, to throw out um, a feeling I have about our current situation. Um, I have a feeling we're going to be doing uh, virtual meetings for the next year. You know, um, it would be lovely if we got back together face to face, but I don't see that in our future. Um, and you seem to have mastered it. Um, and so, and, and um, Vice Chair McGill has done an excellent job supporting you. She's represented us greatly um, at council meetings and I so appreciate what she's doing, but I would, um, my thought is, and I'd love to hear from others um, that we just kind of keep status quo this year. I, I'm not sure anybody needs to learn how to run a meeting virtually as their first, their first go at it. Um, so anyhow, that's my thought is that I would, um, I would think we might want to maintain status quo through this next year. Uh, Vice Chairman Gill? Yeah, I was basically gonna say the same thing, only I restrict it to um, nominating you to continue on as chair because for the reasons that uh, Commissioner Longstreet just, just said. Okay. Um, I would uh, I would add to that to to nominate um, Vice Chair McGill for a second term. Um, I would, and I'll I guess I will second that nomination for Vice Chair McGill. I would I'll like to oh. Commissioner Perry. Yes. Did you did you want to say something? Um, would you like me to? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I was the vice chair until July of 2019. Um, I sort of, I consider myself your ideal candidate as I have lived parks and rec my entire adult life and child, childhood here in Santa Barbara. There were drop-in daycare facilities at Mesa Park and Shoreline Park. There were arts and crafts at the Chase Palm Park Center. I participated in all of the youth sports. As an adult, I've coached hundreds of children for Santa Barbara, basketball, softball. 
I was one of the founding coaches of the Santa Barbara Volleyball Club. I have participated in adult sports for the city of Santa Barbara, the Volleyball Men's Open Division. Um, I have worked with the youth at Franklin School. I've worked with the youth at the West Side Boys and Girls Club. I've organized the music for the city of Santa Barbara for the 4th of July for the previous five years, this year excluded. With the city as a co-sponsor, I put on numerous youth music shows throughout our city. Um, I was the co-founder of the Friends of East Beach. Um, with this, we raised the money to replace all the courts for that facility and created a permanent hall of fame. I've lived our Santa Barbara Parks and Rec. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there um, any other discussion? All right. Um, Hi, Commissioner Martinez. Yeah, I just was trying to clarify. Um, so, I think it was the motion is on the table to um, keep things. I think status quo, right? With uh, Vice Chair McGill as Vice Chair, and you as Chair. And then I'm, I was unclear, Roger. I'm sorry. What, what um, are you making it? A, were you trying to be the vice chair or the chair? Was that what is your intent? I'm sorry, I, I just was a little unclear on, on I'm asking which to be one. Vice chair. Vice chair, got it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you were vice chair in 2019, is what you were saying as well, right? Okay. That is correct. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. I think. I think. I would I would second the idea of just keeping things the same just because it's kind of um, tricky with the way you know COVID is happening and everything. Um, so I would just you know log my sentiment to keep it the same for one more year. I think that would be prudent. My two cents. Thanks. Um, did anyone else want to make a comment before we go to a, a vote? Um, I'm just going to make a comment, uh, Roger. You you have a huge depth and breadth of experience, and you're an invaluable member of this community. Um, I do believe, however, that in these really uncertain times, um, I, I agree with um, Commissioner Longstreet and Vice Chair McGill that what we've done the last couple of months has has been working and and maybe we should stick with that so th those are my comments and if nobody has anything else to say i'll i'll call a vote um for commissioner longstreet's motion for myself as chair and um, kathy mcgill as vice chair and kathy mcgill's second of commissioners longstreet um, of me as chair and my second of Commissioner Longstreet's um, vote as Kathy as chair. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Abstain? Uh, so moved. And um, bef before, that's the last item of our, on our agenda, but I did um, skip over uh, ceremonial items and I just wanted to make sure that there are not uh, some staff members that need recognition. There's always staff members that need recognition, but are there any particular staff members we are recognizing today, Ms. Zachary? Chair Clark and commissioners, we did not have any staff that received recognition for achieving a certain number of years with the city, uh, but I can echo um, your sentiments and thanks to the staff that have been working really hard um, to keep our parks safe and clean and really support the community through the COVID response and they will be very much appreciated by them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you guys are so essential. It's, yeah, so thank you for everything you've done. And with that, I'm going to adjourn this meeting.
We're adjourned. Rose can turn us off.